So in my presentation, I will highlight several cardiology concepts that will be utilized extensively in hemodynamic monitoring afterwards, such as different phases of cardiac cycle, cardiac output with its different equations and factors, and autoregulation and capillary exchange in starting equations. So regarding disclosure, I have to disclose. So at first, the cardiac cycle, it starts usually with atrial, atrial systole. So uh, the, both atrium can contract and force the, the rest of the blood into the ventricle. Then hear. it's going to be followed by... Dr. Mal um, Abdelmabi, sorry, uh, we can see your slides. Can you see my slides? Okay, yes. wait a second. Is it working now? Yes, yes perfect. perfect. Okay. So the cardiac cycle is going to start with atrial systole to force the rest of the blood into the relaxed ventricles. Then it's going to be followed by ventricular systole in three different phases. Then it's going to be followed by ventricular diastole to fill the ventricle again. And on the right side, there is a diagram that is linking the uh, different component of the cardiac cycle with the aor aortic pressure and left ventricular pressure and uh, left atrial pressure and different heart sounds and ventricular volumes changes and jugular venous pulsations and the relation to the QRS complex. So we'll talk about uh, each part of the cardiac cycle. So as we said that the cardiac cycle usually starts with atrial systole. So uh, the duration is 0.1 second. At this time, the atrium contract to push the rest of the remaining blood into the ventricle and it is, it, us, it is usually associated with 25% of blood uh, into the ventricle. And this part is in patient with atrial fibrillation. So this is a clinical part, the clinical implication of the atrial systole. So at that time, both AV valves are open and the semilunar valves are closed. And the ventricular volume reaches the maximum. So it's going to be 120 to 130 milli at the end of this phase. So, and if we talked about the ventricular pressure, it's gonna be increased at first due to the moving blood from the atrium to the, ventric to the ventricle, then it's gonna be followed by slight decrease. While the atrial pressure at first is gonna be increased due to the atrial systole, then it's gonna be followed by reduction of the ventricular pressure due to the, uh, due to, uh, the venous uh, return. And it is correlating to the forced heart sounds. So in patients with atrial fibrillation, this phase is going to be uh, is going to be absent, and in patient with left ventricular uh, lack of compliance, as in patient with left ventricular hypertrophy or patient with uh, hypertension, the forced heart sound is going to be prominent. Second phase is ventricular, the ventricular systole, and the first part of it is uh, the isovolumetric contraction phase. So. Basically, it is associated with increased ventricular wall tension without any change in the volume. So at that time, it's going to be the highest oxygen consumption. And at that time, the ventricle serves as a closed chamber. So both AV valves and semilunar valves are closed to increase the pressure to the maximum. So at the end of this phase, the aortic and uh, pulmonary valves are open. So the maximum in the diastolic volume is going to be 120 to 130 milli, uh, milliliter. And the ventricular pressure is going to be increased due to the increase in wall tension to be able to open the aortic and pulmonary valve. So it's going to reach 80 uh, millimeter mercury. And the atrial pressure at first is going to be increased due to uh, the, the increased ventricular pressure and pushing of uh, the AV valves into the atrium, and then it's going to decrease after in the next phase. So this correlates to also the first heart sound, which is related to the AV valve closure. And as we see on our diagram, uh, the left atrial pressure is going to be increased at first, and left ventricular pressure is left ventricular and dust volume are fixed, and it is correlating to just after the QRS complex. And it's going to be associated with increase in the aortic 
the pressure in this space. Then uh, the rest of the ventricle is going to be the ventricular cyst, the ventricular ejection, which is going to happen in two uh, different parts: the rapid and the reduced ejection. So the rapid ejection phase. So in both phases, the ventricle is going to contract to eject the blood through the aorta and pulmonary into two different phases, which is the rapid ejection, ejecting around 70% of the blood, and reduced ejection, which is going to eject 30% of the blood. So as we see on the right side, on the curves, the, the aortic pressure is gonna be increased and uh, left atrial pressure is gonna start to drop, to drop down. And the, the um, systolic volume is gonna be 50 and ventricular pressure at first, it's gonna increase to 120 milliliter, then it's gonna be reduced. While the atrial pressure at first is gonna be uh, decreased due to AV fiber closure and the valves uh, bowling by the ventricle, followed by gradual increase due to the venous return. And as we see in the ventricular, uh, ventricular volume curve, the left, left ventricle in diastolic pressure um, is going to decrease due to the stroke volume. So after the end of the ventricular systole, the first part of the ventricular diastole is the isovolumetric relaxation phase. And it is just the same as the isovolumetric contraction phase. Ventricles relax without any change in the volume, leading to drop in the in the, the left ventricular pressure, which is which end up uh, by the aorta and pulmonary evolves to close. So it is like a closed. Uh, the ventricle serves as a closed chamber, so all the valves are closed at the time. The vo left ventricular volume is unchanged, so the insystolic volume equals uh, 50, uh, while in the ventricular pressure, it's guard, uh, it will decrease to reach the diastolic level, which, it, which is equivalent to 2 to 10, because uh, the valves are closed and the, the relaxation is isovolumetric. Uh, while the atrial pressure is going to increase gradually due to the accumulation of the venous return. And uh, it's going to be related to the second heart sound, which is uh, the closure of the semi-valves, semi-lunar valves. Afterwards, uh, the ventricular diastole is going to be the filling phases, so it is the same like the ventricular systole. It is rapid and reduced, so uh, fill the ventricle through two different phases plus the H system. So the ventricle fill with blood in three different parts, the rapid phase and the slow the reduced phase and the atrial systole. So uh, left ventricular volume is increased and left atrial volumes are decreased and the ventricular pressure is going to be increased but afterwards it's, it's still lower than the atrial pressure. While the atrial pressure at first it's going to be low due to the blood flow into the ventricles, then it starts to increase again due to the venous return. And at that time, the third heart sound can be heard during the rapid filling phase due to the rush of blood into the ventricular wall. So the clinical significance of the S3, so in patients with mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, S3 is going to be uh, increased. So to talk about uh, the aortic pressure, So the first part of the aortic, uh, the aortic pressure curve is ascending limb. So the blood pressure, the aortic pressure reaches 120 in the rapid ejection phase. And then uh, there is a decrease in the aortic pressure consists with reduced ejection phase. So the blood is in, the blood that is entering the aorta is less than the blood that is leaving it. Then uh, there will be the diacrotic notch, which is sudden drop in pressure caused by AV valve closure at the end of the ventricular systole followed by the diacrotic wave. So there will be a slight increase in the aortic pressure due to the aortic elastic recoil and slow aortic pressure decrease down to 80 due to the continuous blood flow into the systemic arteries. Regarding the jugular venous pressures in the cardiac cycle, so the first wave is the A wave, which is 
correlating to the atrial contraction or the atrial systole. So it is going to be absent in patient with atrial fibrillation. The second wave is the C wave, which is related to the ventricular contraction that pushes the tricuspid valve into the right atrium. Uh, the X descent, which is really which relates to downward displacement of the tricuspid valve uh, in the rapid ventricular ejection phase. So in patients with tricuspid regurgitation and right-sided heart failure, it's going to be absent. Then uh, the V wave, which is related uh, to the venous return, so the rapid atrial filling. Uh, then the Y descent, which is related to the ventricular filling. So in patients with constrictive pericarditis and cardiac tamponade, this wave is going to be absent. And this diagram is a summary for all the cardiac events and pressure. So uh, as we see above, this is the EKG. And it's so the B wave related usually to the atrial systole and the QRS complex related to the ventricular depolarization, which is uh, which is related to the ventricular uh, systole. And uh, this is aortic valve pressure, as we said, um, and the diacrotic notch. And the, this is a curve for the left ventricular pressure. And, and this is the left atrial pressure in different parts of the cardiac cycle and heart sounds. So we'll talk about different thing, which is the ventricular pressure and loop curves. So as we talked about it, the, uh, the ventricular phases are one, the isovolumetric contraction phase, then it's gonna be followed by the ejection phase. Then uh, the third phase is isovolumetric relaxation, uh, followed by rapid filling and reduced filling. So the isovolumetric contraction phase, is, it is the phase that is gonna happen between the mitral valve closure and the aortic valve, the aortic valve opening. And then it's going to be followed by the ejection phase and the iso uh, isovolumetric relaxation phase, which is between the aortic closure and mitral opening, and then uh, the rapid filling and reduced filling. So in patients with increased preload, what, uh, what will happen that, that uh, the systolic volume is going to be increased. So according to first serling loads, those patients will have increased stroke volume. While in patients with increased afterload, so patients with systemic hypertension, the aortic pressure is going to be higher. So the stroke volume is going to be low and the end stroke uh, and systolic volume is going to be higher. Sorry. While in patients with increased contractility, so as if, if the, the stroke volume is going to be increased and the contractility is going to be increased, so the left ventricular ejection fraction is going to be higher, while the systolic volume is going to be low, uh, is going to be lower. So as we see in different parts of the curve. So in patients with increased preload, the stroke volume is going to be increased, while in patients with increased afterload, the aortic pressure and the uh, systolic uh, volume is going to be increased. With the, stroke volume is going to be lower, while in patients with increased contractility, the stroke volume and the ejection fraction is going to be higher. And those are three different, uh, three different diagrams to show uh, what are the changes in the pressure volume curves in the left ventricle according to different uh, parts like the preload, the increased preload, or the increased afterload, or the increased contractility. Uh, and this slide showed the, the ventricular pressure look in patients with vulvar heart diseases. So as we see in patients with aortic stenosis, this is the normal uh, ventricular pressure volume load, and this is the curve in the aortic uh, stenosis. So in patients with aortic stenosis, the left ventricular in the systolic volume, uh, left ventricular in the systolic pressure is going to be increased while there is no change in the left ventricular ejection fraction. And the stroke volume is going to be lower, while the left ventricular and systolic volume is going to be increased. That's why the curve is shifted upward. While in patients with aortic regurgitation, there is no true isovolumetric relaxation phase. 
So in those patients, left ventricular in diastolic volume is going to be increased, which according to Frank Sterling, low results in increase in the stroke volume. So the curve is going to be shifted to the right and upward. While in patient with mitral stenosis, the left atrial pressure is going to be increased. And uh, due to the mitral stenosis, the left ventricular in diastolic volume is going to be lower, while the left ventricular in the systolic volume also and stroke volume is going to be lower. So the curve is going to be shifted to the right, uh, sorry, to the left. In mitral regurgitation patient, it is nearly the same like the aortic, the aortic regurgitation. So there is no isovolumetric relaxation phase. So the left ventricular in diastolic volume is going to be increased in the stroke volume is going to be increased due to the Frank Sterling law and left ventricular in systolic volume is going to be lower. So as we see, the curve is more prominent than the normal one. And those curves show the changes in different uh, types of heart failure. So in patients with systolic heart failure, the left ventricular in diastolic pressure is going to be higher and also the left ventricular in diastolic volume and left ventricular in systolic volume, while the and ejection fracture is going to be lower, so the curve is going to be shifted downward and to the right. While in diastolic heart failure, the main mechanism is the impaired ventricular relaxation, so the left ventricular in diastolic pressure is going to be increased, while there is no changes in the left ventricular ejection fraction or the left ventricular in diastolic volume. So different equations for cardiac output, stroke volume. So the stroke volume uh, at the end diastolic pressure minus the insystolic, uh, the insystolic volume, while the fraction is the stroke volume divided by in diastolic volume or the in diastolic volume minus the in systolic volume divided by in diastolic volume. Cardiac output, we can measure it by uh, multiplying the stroke volume to the heart rate and the fixed principle is mainly related to the oxygen consumption and the differences between uh, the oxygen concentration in both venous and the arterial. So um, it can be calculated by the fixed principle while the cardiac index is the cardiac output divided by the body surface area. Uh, pulse pressure, it is uh, the, the systolic blood pressure minus the diastolic blood pressure, while the mean arterial blood pressure is the cardiac output uh, multiplied by the total uh, peripheral resistance. Uh, systemic vascular resistance or total peripheral resistance can be calculated by the mean arterial blood pressure uh, minus the right atrial pressure or the central venous pressure divided by the cardiac output and then multiplied by 80. So this diagram showed, uh, shows the cardiac output and the systemic vascular resistance and factor affecting both of them. So the so, uh, cardiac output is mainly related to the stroke volume and the heart rate. So any condition that can increase the stroke volume or the heart rate is going to be associated with increase in uh, the, uh, the cardiac output, so in patients with tachycardia, so if the parasympathetic impulses or, uh, was decreased or increased sympathetic stimulation or increased venous return due to increase the blood volume or increase the skeletal muscle bump or the vasoconstriction, all of those dishes will be associated with increased venous return, which will be associated with increase in the stroke volume and the cardiac output. While other factors that affect the systemic vascular resistance, it is mainly related to the, uh, the blood viscosity or uh, the total blood vessel length or the vasoconstriction or the, which is uh, the blood vessel radius. So all of those conditions is associated with increased mean arterial blood pressure. This diagram shows uh, different changes in uh, the preload. So in patient, uh, if the ventricular compliance is increased, so the preload is going to be uh, increased. If the, venous, uh, if the venous pressure is going to be increased, so the ventricular preload is going to be increased. If uh, with any uh, conditions that is associated with increased blood volume, and the venous pressure is going to be increased and also the preload. Uh, 
in patients uh, in if the heart rate is decreased, so the ventricular preload is going to be increased. And this diagram showed the effect affecting uh, the stroke volume. So the stroke volume is mainly related to the preload or the afterload or the contractility. So any conditions that is associated with increased uh, end diastolic volume is going to be associated with increased uh, in the stroke volume due to the Frank Sterling law, while also the contractility, uh, if the contractility is increased, uh, the stroke volume is going to be increased, while in uh, if the afterload is increased, the, the, uh, the stroke volume is going to be decreased. So those are the factors affecting the stroke volume, the preload, and the contractility and the afterload. This diagram showed uh, the, the oxygen demand and the factors affecting the oxygen demand, uh, the myocardial oxygen demand. So it is related to the cardiac contractility and the myocardial wall tension and the heart rate. So any condition that is associated with increased heart rate or increased uh, cardiac work like exercise, so the cardiac contractility is going to be increased or increase the myocardial wall tension is going to be associated with increase in the oxygen demand. Also, any changes in the ventricular volume or pressure due to changes in the preload or afterload is going to be associated with increased oxygen demand. And here, as we see, we can decrease the heart rate by using beta blockers, some calcium channel blockers to affect the heart rate and the contractility, while we can decrease uh, the preload using nitrates or the afterload with calcium channel blockers. Uh, the heart itself can actually control the volume using A and B and B and B. So uh, atrial with atrial distension due to increased um, volume or sympathetic stimulation or angiotensin two or endothelin, the right atrial my the atrial myocytes usually secrete the A, the A and B, which is going to be associated with uh, natriuresis or diuresis due to increase due to um, afferent arterial vasodilatation and different vasoconstriction to increase the intragromerular pressure, which is going to be associated with natriuresis and decrease the blood volume. So uh, it's going to decrease the sentinel pressure to, to enable the cardiac output. So also the ANB is associated with peripheral vasodilatation, so it's going to decrease the systemic vascular resistance to decrease the mean arterial blood pressure, and also it's going to reduce the renin release to reduce the, uh, the angiotensin 2 and aldosterone, and it's going to be degraded at the end by the neuropeptidases. BNB works with the same mechanism, but uh, it has a, a longer uh, half-life. Uh, regarding the autoregulation, the main receptors that is involved in the autoregulation is the baroreceptor uh, and the chemoreceptor. So uh, there is um, baroreceptors in both the aortic arch and the carotid sinus, and both of them mainly related to changes in blood pressure. So the aortic arch transmits through the vagus nerve to the solitary nucleus in the medulla in response to hypotension or hypertension, and uh, the carotid sinus also um, transmit to as a solitary nucleus of the middle of the so the glossopharyngeal, and also it is related to changes in blood pressure. Mm. While bar, so uh, in baroreceptor, if there is any uh, conditions that is associated with hypotension, uh, so the uh, the arterial blood pressure is going to be lower, so the stretch is going to be lower, so uh, afferent baroreceptor firing. Uh, which results in increased sympathetic firing and decreased efferent baro, uh, barosympathetic stimulation resulting in vasoconstriction to increase the heart rate and increase contractility and increase blood pressure. While the chemoreceptor mainly related to the change in the BO2 or the PCO2 or the BH of the blood, there are two different kinds of chemoreceptors, peripheral chemoreceptors or central chemoreceptors, and mainly they, uh, they can be affected by the same BCO2, BH, and BO2. Uh, this slide showed how different organs can maintain a constant blood flow over a wide range of uh, peripheral perfusion. So for the heart, the local metabolites such as adenosine and uh, nitric oxide and uh, hypercapnia or hypoxia can be associated with coronary vasodilatation, while also in the brain, the local metabolites such as increase the CO2 or decrease the pH is going to be associated with cerebral vasodilatation. Uh, 
uh, regarding the kidney, the myogenic and tubular uh, glomerular feedback, <coughs> skeletal muscle at rest, the sympathetic tone in the arteries, maintain the blood flow while during exercise, the local metabolites such as increased uh, hydrogen and lactic acid and uh, potassium and CO2 and adenosine can be associated with uh, vasodilatation. In the skin, the main is a sympathetic vasoconstriction for uh, temperature control, while the lung is having different mechanisms. So uh, the response of the lung to hypoxia can result in vasoconstriction to shift the blood to more aerated areas. This slide talks about the capillary fluid exchange and the different forces and pressures that is involved. So this is the arterial end, and this is the venous end, and this is the capillary. So in the arterial end, there is a net filtration pressure of 10, and it is related to uh, the inward uh, forces and the outward forces. So the inward forces, the outward forces is the blood, the <coughs> interstitial hydrostatic pressure towards the the as, um, Interstitial fluid collide osmotic pressure that pulls the fluid out, and the capillary hydrostatic pressure or the filtration pressure pushing the fluid out of the capillaries, while the plasma oncotic pressure and the interstitial hydrostatic pressure pushes the fluid into the capillaries. Also, there are two different forces also affecting that, which is the capillary permeability to fluids and the capillary permeability to protein or the, refl the reflection coefficient. So, at the arterial end, the net filtration pressure is. Uh, plus 10 millimeter mercury, so the fluid is so the net uh, the net fluid movement at the at this part is going to be filtration, while at the venous end the net filtration is resorption due to increased pressure. And, and as we see, there is a, a difference between uh, the arterial and venous end around uh, one to three millimeter mercury. So there are still fluid in the in the tissues that will be removed by the lymphatics. And thank you.